We shall now go on to Dr. Anurag Mishra, who is uh, has, uh, a great surgeon uh, par excellence and practices at Radha, Radha Raman Hospital in uh, Telangu Bazar, Katak. And he's going to talk to us about aligning the toric and multifocal eyes for perfect outcomes. Thank you so much, uh, Chitra Ma'am, Team I Foundation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings and regards from the land of Raja Jagannath. I'll start my talk with a small rigmarole, uh, which involved a patient. And he came to me after a torical implant. And uh, he had no particular complaint and just come to me. He had just come to me uh, just like that. It's like some tearing, watering, some itching, some sort of uh, trivial complaint was there. I put him under the uh, uh, refraction board first. It showed me that the patient, of course, as I said, had no visual complaint. The right eye was the one which was pseudophagic. The foropter screen showed that he accepted a 0.25 cylinder along 165 degrees axis. And the vision was six, six parts, even uncorrected. So 0.25 just made it a little clearer. But when I dilated the patient, I saw the toric aisle being malaligned or placed at seven degrees off axis. I was curious and I subjected this patient to eye trace. And this is what I found. The top left-hand picture will show you the DLI scores when there has been no glass correction, as you can as you can see, the glass sign has been the spectacle sign has been put across on. Although the internal plane shows a DLI value of perfect ten, you can see the distortion that's there. Down below, when the glass correction is being placed, the distortion is gone completely. I've intentionally not hidden the name of the patient right on top, right hand side corner, as you can see, so that you get to know that it's the same patient I'm talking about and not doctored the pictures at all. If you go to the MTF screen, same patient, the MTF value, look at that. It is crossing the critical square. square the, the value at 10 cycles per degree is 0.137 in the corneal plane and 0.170 in the internal plane. But when we are correcting it with glasses, the MTF scores also increase. What it means is, even with a 0.25 cylindrical residual, we say that 10 degrees off axis alignment is what is important or what is significant. But even below that, it can cause distortion of the imagery, even if it doesn't reduce vision per se. So here is what is important. We have to align the toric aisles exactly along the desired axis or the axis that has been told to us by the aisle calculator. How do we do that? We ensure a proper alignment first, and then we ensure that there's negligible post-implantation rotation. How do I ensure that I, it is a proper alignment? The first thing to do is to register the eyes. And I use an image guidance almost exclusively. Why I'm speaking of image guidance is because people think that if you manually mark, you're likely to go wrong. But the moment you install an image guidance machine in a setup, you're completely foolproof and you're likely to hit the target bang on 100% of the time. Doesn't happen always. Look at this screen now. This is a perfect eye, which is being registered under the microscope and the registration is failing. This can happen even if you have selected the right patient and the right data has come in, the registration can fail due to several reasons. What you do then is you just align the axis negatively by one or positively by one. This gives a signal to the machine that you're trying to override is its automated registration system and it goes to the manual mode and then registers the eye. This is just one trick. This can happen to everybody. I minimize the use of viscoelastic. Not only do I hydro implant all my IOLs, but the other tip I use is the IOL is brought right next to the tip before it is implanted. So the IOL is right next to the tip of the cartridge. So that very minimal viscoelastic is left even in the cartridge beak. The moment you lift the uh, or uh, leave the IOL inside, the viscoelastic that is there, which is minimal in quantity as it is, gets, gets washed off with the fluid current. However, when I use IOLs, which are not exactly truly hydrophobic, meaning the water content is slightly more than 1% to 2%, as in this IOL, this tends to be sticky. These IOL surfaces tend to be sticky and they adhere to the viscoelastic more. So what I do is, after implanting them inside the bag, I just rotate them clockwise and counterclockwise a few times before aligning them along the axis so that all the viscoelastics are washed off. I don't need to use aspiration per se. Just rotate it a few times so that the viscoelastics get washed off. When we align the toric IOL in 
using an image guidance, there are three things which we should notice or we should ensure. Three messages that come in the image guidance. One is a parabola that comes on the left hand side, as you can see here. And there's a ball that is that is traveling throughout the length. This parabola tells us that there is 18 degrees of cyclorotation being compensated for. That's what the image guidance can do. The cyclorotation is more than that. The ball will disappear and you know that you're not aligning it properly. Number two, the IOL has to completely unfold before you align it. If it stays scaffold, I mean, if it stays scaffold, then the alignment is not proper. Third, down below, there is a message called tracking OK. The other message that sometimes comes is center the eye. We tend to miss that. We have to ensure that the message comes in is tracking OK. Only then you know that you are along perfect axis. Let me give you an example. Here is a case where the alignment axis is 173 degrees and the ball is in the parabola and the message down below is tracking OK. I try to align it. By aligning, in the process of aligning it, what I miss is the ball is actually attempting to go out of the margin. It's gone out and look at the axis. It's shifted, it's changed, but that's not the proper axis. So I get bewildered. I, I miss the point that the parabola is not having the ball right now. I rotate it back, which is actually not the right axis. Then I remove the two instruments from the eye. The eye comes back to its original position and we get to see that the axis is shifted back. Now the ball has come back to the parabola. So it is so very important to see whether the ball is there in the parabola, in the parabolic uh, premises or not. Because when we introduce the irrigation cannula, accidentally, inadvertently, we actually also induce some amount of cyclotorsion without it ever coming to our notice. All our focus is on the IOL. <clears throat> Here is a case wherein the axis, despite of everything happened correctly, it is 178 degrees. My, my uh, incision is 180, but the axis is shown elsewhere. So what I do is I switch off the uh, image guidance there and I go back to my axis marking, which was along 180 degrees. Now it shows that I'm bang on. So this comes with experience, even with all the help you get from the machinery and the, and the ecosystem. Sometimes you have to get back to your experience to know whether you have aligned it properly or not. Irrespective of, so this is about how to properly align it. This is about forming the AC after it has been aligned properly. Now we are, we have implanted an IOL that is, that has the track record of the best post-operative rotation of stability. Look at the IOL rotating when you over enthusiastically inflate the, inflate the AC. It gives us a strong message that here in the pupil is well dilated. So you could see the marks and you could see it rotate. But if the aisle would have been, the pupil would have been any smaller, then it would have been hidden. So it is very important for us to realize that the AC should be formed just to make the globe turgid and not overinflate it at all. When we handle small pupils, the trick is to rotate the IOL to the proposed axis of alignment, close to it. And with experience, you know where the axis is. Then you rotate it slightly so that the mark is seen repeatedly retract the pupil to see whether the mark is along the axis. You can use the same uh, 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 dialer, Sinsky, or you can also see a Y-shaped hook, which hooks the pupillary margin and retracts it so that you get to know exactly where the IOL marks are before leaving the IOL. This is one special, special situation, the small pupil toric alignment. And the other special situation is this. Um, this is a posterior polar cataract, and you can see the big PCR that's happened. Luckily, I had enough capsule to support the haptics. However, I must do a reverse optic capture here. So the reverse optic capture is something that you do. Uh, but after the reverse optic capture is done, the irrigation cannula is something I do not withdraw instantaneously. I stay there with the irrigation cannula on. The ball is still there in the, in the parabola. The message is... Uh, uh, center the uh, tracking the uh, tracking okay and while the irrigation is still being pumped the ac is formed through all the other ports that are available this is something i do because once the reverse capture the reverse capturing uh, the optic or even capturing the optic in a single piece aisle is not very easy so i just make sure that the ac does not fluctuate it doesn't depress it doesn't shallow or doesn't deepen uh, quickly so that uh, the irrigation kind of maintains the AC while other the other ports are uh, the other ports are sealed. 
that's all I could manage in this edition. I think uh, there are many other things to go, but I intentionally just skipped it in the interest of time. Thank you so much for the opportunity, ma'am, once again. That was a wonderful talk. Every word said was brilliant. And you're one of your best talks, Anurag. So damn good. Nice. So just maybe one question, Tamil, you could take. Yes, ma'am. Like, uh, what are the tips on uh, manual marking uh, if you're going to do? The, Dr. Anurag? Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, it's it's very traditional teaching, uh, Tamil. You have to dry the cornea. You have to uh, uh, mark it in front of a slit lamp or anywhere when the patient is seated so that there's no cyclorotation, natural cyclorotation happening. It should be as thin as possible. Um, you take the patient to the OT, ask him to lie down, re reinforce the marking again as thin as possible. But in my experience, no manual marking, uh, actually, I have not been, it's not worked in my hands properly. It's, no manual marking I have been able to produce, which is not fudged and which is as thin as the image guidance. So um, uh, sometimes it is wider than is desired. Sometimes the uh, the marks on the proximal and the distal uh, paths are not along the same line. So one of them is aligned, the other is not. You know, so the parallax is more likely to happen. So uh, these are the things, but talking about tips, yeah, they should be as thin as possible, bang on opposite. And when you mark it uh, on the table, the uh, Purkinje image should be right at the center of the pole uh, when you mark the uh, the alignment axis. Dr. Rohit, would you want a question <clears throat> to ask a question? Yeah, Dr. Anurag. Uh, yes, sir. Good the DLI score was, how do you uh, explain that with minus 0 0.25? You will be surprised. I mean, I even I was surprised. I must say, sir, that the DLI score uh, objectively traced on the eye trace sometimes actually overestimates things. I do agree to that. But what it does tell us is there is an image distortion. There is an image which is not exactly clear. There is a defocus that's happening at the imagery plane. It does could tell us that. So because it, when we could it be because of some posterior capsular uh, opacification? So then it will not be clearer with the 0.25 cylinder being in place, sir. If it is internal, absolutely. then it will not go away with the yeah. spectacle correction. Absolutely. So, so very difficult to explain because uh, with the, <clears throat> you know with seven degree rotation, uh, it should not have been only minus 0 0.25. No, it depends on the toric trim, sir. How much yeah, of I, no, no, what I'm trying to say is so misalignment is misalignment would have caused you know plus minus sort of situation yes. not yes so for this patient to have a spherical equivalence as zero you have to put zero plus plus 0 0.12 as a sphere yeah which is not available in the uh, foropter machinery that i use from topcon so it starts with a 0.25 so that's the reason maybe with the, i couldn't place it i i play, tried to place a 0.25 if the patient didn't, didn't accept perhaps a 0 0.12 would have been accepted by the patient no, no, I was no. saying that uh, sometimes, even if it is below seven degrees, the measurable toricity that is there is, I think we started from 0 0.25. 0 .25. What I wanted to impress upon is, even if it is less than 0 0.25, which is not measurable, which we do not place as a, as a correcting lens in front of the trial frame or in front of the foropter, the image distortion could be there. Yeah. This is completely, this has opened a new dimension to me. I'm trying to study more on this. This is just a chance discovery that I made and I'm trying to look more into it. But yeah, I mean, this has opened a new thing to me. Absolutely. Very nice presentation, Anurag. And uh, objectively, you showed that uh, 0.25, the difference it makes. But practically, we don't really see that. You know, I at least have quite a few of my toric patients who have a 0.25 cylinder left over. The optometrist notices it, but then patient is not complaining and I don't do anything about it. My tolerance for... Rotating lenses is very low. If there is a complaint, the spherical equivalent is nearly zero, I go ahead and rotate. But then having said that, there are quite a few patients with 0.25 cylinder or even occasional 0.5 cylinder who had initially started out with a 3.5 cylinder and their patient is not complaining, I leave them alone. Frankly, I don't put them on a high trace and see what is their DLI score. But then uh, I don't know whether they would be complaining a lot more if the it caused such a, a significant deterioration. No, sir. This patient also was not complaining of anything. As I said at the beginning, this patient was not complaining of anything with regards to vision. He had just come for some watering issue or something of that sort, if I remember. 
So, but when we placed the 0.25 cylinder and asked him to look at it meticulously, reduce the contrast on our charts, try to look more into it, more detailed into it. Of course, we didn't overdo it because then the patient will think that there's something wrong happened to uh, with regards to the placement of the IOL. But we did see a difference. The patient was able to experience a slight improvement in the vision quality when we, we were placing the 0.25 cylinder. So it needs to be looked at. But the point here is we should always ensure that it is aligned along the exact desired axis as has been depicted by the IL planner. Sure. Adam, one, one point he was telling about the thinness of the marking. We yes. can use a very, very, very small 20-27 uh, gauge needle to make a thin strip. So that will be a very thin mark. And also nowadays I've started loading the Salcon lenses under saline. So no, no uh, visco into the cartridge also. So many lenses can be uh, loaded under saline and so no visco at all to go underneath the IOL also you don't have to. The haptics don't get stuck? No, no. no. Saline haptics no, haptic don't get stuck. Has a silicon coating on the underneath, on the inner side of the cartridge, ma'am. So the passage becomes little, uh, I mean, way easier than, uh, when, than what we can expect from a typical hydrophobic IOL. But it is, uh, I mean, uh, sir is obviously far more. No, for years, for years, I'm using it in saline only. Saline only, all alcohol lenses. It just goes smooth. No, yeah. just so that the, uh, anyone listening doesn't go away with the impression that you need a digital marking device to huh. start toric lenses. Absolutely. But something yeah. like uh, immersion A scan and uh, uh, optical biometer is great to have an optical biometer, but that does not mean that if you don't have one, you can't do uh, uh, torics of multifocals with uh, immersion A scan. Similarly, there are several studies which have shown even when we translated onto digital marking, which was almost 10 years back, where when you compare patients getting a uh, manual marking done and digital marking done, the results are almost uh, uh, comparable. Uh, at least when the uh, surgeon is very adapted doing the digital uh, manual marking. Of course, it's uh, much easier and I completely rely on my digital marking device. But just in case you do not have it, does not mean that you should not be implanting toric and top lenses. True, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanya.